so at the sort of street le fighting level, you know, how, how do they portray you and, and, well, and the, the ID community? Right, at, at the, uh, in the media okay. and in, at the street level, <laughs> there is an attempt oftentimes to caricature our position and to confuse us or to conflate intelligent design with, for example, young earth creationism, which many of the, uh, you know, in the academic circles, that's a way of, of trying to uh, impute disreputability to intelligent design. Now, intelligent design, there are advocates of intelligent design who are young earth creationists, but young earth creationism and intelligent design are two different things. Uh, intelligent design is not based on scriptural revelation. It's, it is not a deduction or an interpretation of a scriptural text. It's an inference from biological evidence or from cosmological or physical evidence. So that's one difference. The starting point is completely different. The basis of intelligent design is scientific evidence, not scripture. And secondly, intelligent design is an age-neutral theory. It's not making claims about the age of the Earth. Uh, young Earth creationism is clearly making the claim that the Earth is, is very young. But intelligent design is taking on this central Darwinian proposition that says that the appearance of design is an illusion. We're saying, no, it's real. And you can tell by looking at certain evidences. So it's, we're really engaging in a completely different question than creationism. Um, you, uh, we're on the subject of populism. Who, who, who knows um, where these recordings will go? But you use terms like abductive and retrodictive. Could you just expand on those? Well, in the PhD work I did in, at Cambridge in the 1980s, I was investigating the question of whether or not um, well, I was investigating, first and foremost, the question of how scientists reason about events in the remote past. When you're looking at uh, evolutionary history and trying to understand the origin of the first life or the origin of animal life, how, uh, that's a different kind of science than when you go into the lab and repeat an experiment under controlled conditions that can be replicated by someone else. Um, and so, I, in my PhD work, I gave a characterization of the historical scientific method to show how it uh, was being used by evolutionary biologists or by cosmologists or archaeologists or forensic scientists. And it turns out that whereas in many branches of science, science scientists rely on inductive reasoning or a method of reasoning that's called the hypothetico-deductive method, in biology or in historical sciences, scientists reason from effects back to causes. We have the, the clues that are left behind and we try to figure out what caused those clues and that's, that's a form of inference that's called abduction or it's also retrodictive in the sense that it's going backwards in time. So it's a different scientific method and interestingly it's the method that Darwin used in The Origin of Species and it, I use the same method of reasoning in develop, developing my case for intelligent design and signature in the cell and in Darwin's doubt and so it actually it's kind of a ir irony in that I'm using Darwin's method of reasoning to come to a non-Darwinian conclusion about design. But I have great respect for him as someone who wrote, a, obviously, a, a great scientific book. And I especially appreciate his pioneering use of this historical scientific method, which I use, even though I part company with him on the design question. And I've, I've got young children. The appeal to, to them, uh, and I suppose to school communities, is the simplicity of saying, this is the evidence. And so if I was asking on behalf of my 12-year-old son, I'd say, what is the evidence for ID? Absolutely. That's very good because I think the evidence is very compelling and can be comprehended by people at various levels. It, it, it uh, admits various levels of scientific analysis. But to me, the stop press moment in the history of biology was not only the discovery of the structure of the DNA molecule in 1953 by Watson and Crick, but what ensued from that in this, this period of the molecular biological revolution, 1957, Francis Crick proposes something called the sequence hypothesis. And what he argues is, or what he suggests, is the DNA molecule has um, the chemical subunits along the interior of the spine of the DNA molecule that are functioning just like alphabetic characters in a written language or digital characters in the machine code. They're literally storing information in a digital or alphabetic form for constructing the proteins and protein machines that, that cells need to stay alive. So when we think about what's running the show in biology, we're actually talking about information, uh, genetic text, and that, or some scientists refer to it as digital code. 
um, our local hero in the Seattle area, Bill Gates, says that DNA is like a software program, only much more complex than, it, one, than any that has ever been created. Uh, Richard Dawkins himself acknowledges that DNA is uncannily machine-like. Uh, the, 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 the information in DNA is uncannily machine-like. It's, it's like computer code. Now, um, most younger people are more intuitively uh, connected to the information technology that we use in computers. And I used to ask my students, if you, have to, if you want to give your computer a new function, what do you have to give it? And students would get it right away. You need code or a program or digital code. And the same thing is true in life. If you want to build a new animal from a pre-existing animal, you have to have new information. If you want to build uh, life in the first place from simpler non-living chemicals, you've got to have the chemicals arrange themselves into informational sequences that are capable of bu building the proteins and machines that we need to keep cells alive. So one of the primary evidences of design is the digital information that's stored in the DNA molecule. It is, um, it has me the, the same attributes as um, a written language or a digital code. And, and applying the, 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 the same method, um, uh, are there other, you know, more credible explanations for uh, its existence? Well, there are a, a alternative explanations. And, and in the book Signature in the Cell, because I use the inference to the best explanation method that Darwin pioneered, um, I go through those competing explanations. And I ex explain them, uh, describe them, and then also critique them. And the, the, uh, the big story in Origin of Life Research is that there has, over the last 20 to 30 years, there has been a deepening impasse in the field because whether the theories are invoking chance or law-like necessity or some combination of the two, they have all failed to explain the origin of the information that's necessary to build or generate the first living cell. And so that's the, that's the, the unsolved problem from the standpoint of materialistic evolutionary theory. But that's also where I think intelligent design comes in, because what we know from experience is that intelligent agents are capable of generating information. They have what philosophers call the known causal power to produce the effect in question. And this is also part of the Darwinian method. When you're trying to make an inference to the best explanation about what caused something in the remote past, you need to invoke causes that are known to produce the effect in question. And he got this principle from his mentor, Charles Lyell, the great geologist, uh, pioneering geologist, who said that we should be looking for causes now in operation. And when I came across that phrase in Lyell's work, I said, I, it, it, it was a, a, a moment when the nickel dropped. You know, you had an aha moment. And I said to myself, I asked myself the question, what is the cause now in operation that produces digital information, digital code? And I realized there was only one such cause that was known. It was intelligence. I knew of the impasse in original life studies. I knew that causes based on chance or invoking chance, necessity, or the combination were unable to produce information. But there is a cause of which we know that does produce information, and that's mind or intelligence. One information scientist said that information is habitually associated with conscious activity. And so when we find information at the foundation of life, the most natural thing to infer, based on our knowledge of cause and effect, is that conscious activity, intelligence, produce that information.